Good morning, and welcome to our worship here at First Congregational Church of Wauwatosa. As you know, we are all online because of the alarming increase of the COVID-19 in the state of Wisconsin, and we want you to be safe. That is the most important thing to us. We pray that you and your loved ones stay safe in the weeks ahead in these difficult days, and we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. We are called to worship on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not hither but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread for the eater, so shall God's word be that goes forth from his mouth. It shall not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which he prospered and prosper in the thing for which he sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Please pray along with me the prayer of invocation. Eternal God, loving creator, we come to worship you on this day with your love alive in our hearts. We seek to find guidance for our lives and nourishment for our souls. Be with us now in this time of quiet praise and prayer so that we can return to our daily lives with new direction and dedication, living as you have taught us through your Son. It is in Jesus' name we pray together that prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Last week, we talked about what happened when Moses went up the mountain and then came down and saw the people parting before an idol, and he broke the tablets that the Lord God had given him. So today we're talking about what those tablets, what was written on those tablets, and what the Lord God repeated to the people. We start at verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But on the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or a male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here it ends the reading inspired by God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation.
Last week, after listening to Barry's sermon, I realized that it has been some time since I have preached on the Ten Commandments. They are, after all, the Big Ten. I think the Ten Commandments are the most revered but misunderstood biblical teachings beginning with the claim that this list forms the basis for the legal system in the West, or that posting them in more places, especially in schools, would, would just help turn this country around. They're not called the Ten Suggestions, after all. So let's look at them one more time to see what we might have missed. What are they, really? And where did they come from? The commandments are a list of religious decrees attributed to Moses after his encounter with God up on Mount Sinai. The first four are designed to guide the believer toward a proper relationship with God. The remaining six deal with our relationship with other people. Those final six are negative in form. You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, covet your neighbor's stuff. But for the record, only two of the commandments are actually incorporated into our legal code, the prohibitions against stealing and murder. You probably also know that Protestants, Catholics, and Jews have compiled slightly different lists, although the core demands are the same. And while Muslims do not list the commandments in the Quran per se, they do honor Moses as a prophet. So to begin, the Ten Commandments are one of the earliest attempts to lay down rules and guidelines to sustain community. They go to the heart of the ways in which people who violate those rules unravel the world and create alienation and discord and violence. The ideas behind them matter, even though they're often most misunderstood as products of a particular and primitive culture. We break these rules all the time. Even the people who weep over the monuments to the Ten Commandments on the courthouse lawn do so not realizing that their insistence on a particular religious shrine is itself a form of idolatry which violates the first commandment against idolatry. When we insist that this list contains all that should be known and followed, we ignore the ways in which so many other religious traditions have their own lists and have been sustained by them. You've heard of the eightfold path of Buddhism known as the wheel of the law. It forbids murder, unchastity, theft, falsehood, and especially covetous behavior. What is important to remember is not whose list is the right list, but, but rather that we acknowledge that all the lists have this in common. They guide us toward relationships built on trust rather than on fear. Because only through trust can, can there be love. When trust is lost, relationships are lost. This is the true consequence of violating the commandments. It diminishes the possibility of love, which diminishes the possibility of life. We know that as an observant Jew, Jesus was raised on the commandments. Remember Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler, a man who had too much love for too much stuff? Jesus told him, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. So let's begin with, you shall have no other gods before me. It's no accident that this commandment against idolatry in all of its forms should be at the top of the list. I mean, think of all the golden calves in our culture. Money at the top of the list, then some sort of fame, even if it's infamy, and of course the countless illusions inside our heads that 
that make us believe we will never die and we are really, really big deals. That the world owes us something and that we are somehow exempt from life's pain and suffering. Idols promise us power and invincibility. God does not. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. We've got all three levels of the universe covered. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. This includes, I'm afraid to say, the iPhone 12. For some of us, it includes the Grateful Dead, for others, Beyonce, the Green Bay Packers, stock options, and the list could go on and on. Idols are seductive, precisely because they're here, they're visible, they're, they're tangible, not like this mystery we call God. I mean, just how much emptiness and invisibility does God expect us to run on before we need something tangible, something we can hold on to? The warning here is that idols never deliver anything that lasts. When they're done with us, they discard us. Idols promise what they cannot deliver. And so Moses says, don't put them on the top shelf. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, growing up, we were taught that this meant not to use profanity, don't swear. But when the commandments were written, it was a whole different thing. When commandments were written, a, several, a civil contract was sworn in the name of the Lord to make it binding. If broken, the offending party would be guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, since we don't make legal arrangements this way anymore, this commandment has lost much of its original meaning. Except when someone curses on the golf course in the presence of the minister, or when the minister curses and someone quotes to the reverend the third commandment. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy especially for shopping and sleeping in and watching the football game. You know, there was a time when taking a single day off was considered to be not lazy, but really good for you. A sort of sacred responsibility. Six days we work, but then we, we rest for one day. So we can think about why we worked six days in the first place. Instead of rushing around one more day, we pause to remember that, that work is a means to an end and not an end unto itself. The commandment to keep the Sabbath is the only item in the list that is referred to as holy. Recently, there has been renewed interest in the idea of Sabbath because, well, because, well, look at us. We don't know when to stop. Just, just try no cell phone for one day, I dare you. Or no screens. Have a screen-free, cell phone-free day. All day. And that's when you'll know how much we need a Sabbath. Our restless lives cry out for peace, and, and we go and we go and we go in order to get. And then we wake up one day to realize there's no more time to enjoy all that we've gotten. Just think about it, one day to rest, to read, to talk to one another, to, to walk, to watch the sky, to pet the dog, to take a nap and, and to listen to the wind outside your window. Number five, honor your father and your mother. I like this one. There's nothing like being a parent to make you understand why this honor is due. Not because parents don't fail, and sometimes miserably, but because human beings who raise other human beings 
are engaged in the most difficult, the most exhausting, and the most frightening occupation on earth. We're not to make idols of our parents, of course, but but we're commanded to honor them. We must separate from them, of course, and live as adults and find our own way. And sometimes parents must be forgiven. But this too is a way to honor them. When they're gone, you are conscious of the void that is left in the universe. The commandment doesn't say to to fear them or to try and duplicate them or, or even allow them to control your fate. It just says honor is due. Honor your mother and your father. Number six, you shall not kill. Oh my, the ways that we have found exceptions to this commandment. You shall not kill, or it's now translated in the New Revised Standard Version, you shall not murder. A difference that is real, but has also led to many tortured rationalizations of the true intent of the commandment. We can all imagine situations in which we would kill and do kill. But in finding them and in stressing them, we ignore the pure, distilled simplicity of this commandment. Do not take life from another. It is the basis of all ethics. It is not yours to take, and yours is not for anyone else to take. We did not make ourselves. We should never unmake another. This is the baseline commandment that builds a wall between the violence we would do to one another and the life force that's at the heart of the mystery of God. You shall not kill. One of the greatest challenges to military chaplains is is working with soldiers who who are trained to kill but find it impossible to fully detach themselves from the inhumanity of what they've been asked to do. If the church cannot recover its simple, basic aversion to violence in all forms, then we have lost our soul. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. When it happens, what is lost is not just the integrity of intimacy, But trust, the breaking of promises undoes the world. There are few moments more tender and more hopeful than the taking of vows, and fewer things more destructive than breaking them. The world is littered with the damage of broken promises in marriage. It breaks children, it destroys friendship, it it undoes the world. This commandment is not naive and victorious. Surely its its author knows how often human beings go in search of something new, something ideal. And in doing so, we put at risk everything we value. Every good thing in life is made possible through covenant. So we must keep our covenant promises. Number eight, you shall not steal, unless, of course, you can get away with it. And many, many people do get away with it. That is, their theft is cloaked in ambition. It's not like they they break into houses and stuff stuff into a sack. Rather, they find ways to acquire what other people have by being dishonest with them. Do not take what is not yours by dishonest means. This is pretty clear. The world is full of deceit driven by the desire to get something for nothing. Beware. Number nine. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. 
Why not? Because, because lying undoes the world. Like the boy who cried wolf, lying destroys credibility until you become literally unbelievable. The Greeks thought that when you could no longer be trusted and believed, you might as well be dead. Like that boy who cried wolf, lying undoes trust, and trust undoes relationships. And relationships are what make life worthwhile and make us happy. What's more, when, when trust is gone because of lies discovered, nobody knows how to restore it. You can't take a, a restoration of trust pill. It doesn't exist. No minister, no shaman, no politician, no magistrate has a formula by which trust can be restored. And sometimes it is never restored, and so neither is the relationship. Telling the truth is difficult sometimes, but, but it's always better than the alternative. Look at our political system. It's death by lying. We wouldn't recognize the truth now if someone told it to us. And so we give up on everyone and on everything. The commandment asks that you not deceive. That you not acquire anything of benefit to yourself by, by lying in everyday life or by taking advantage of other people. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That has its roots in this idea. Do not manipulate the world to your advantage by speaking falsely. And finally, number 10, the most American commandment of all. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or his wife or any of the other things he owns. And how sad that the wife is listed among the possessions. But this was a patriarchal society as are most societies to this day. What this commandment really says is that greed is the destroyer of worlds. We want what we don't have because we think that, that when we get it, we will be happy or we'll be famous or we'll be admired by our friends. We've created in America the most elaborate and deplorable culture of greed on earth. It drives people to do desperate things, to turn against those they love to teach their own, cheat their own friends to take enormous risks so they might have what someone else has or, or more than they have. You know, I have, I have yet to stand at the bedside of a dying person and have her tell me that she wanted more of anything at that moment except time. I've met wealthy people who are happy, but I have never met a single person whose wealth made them happy. To the contrary, I've seen lives wasted and families destroyed and communities undone by greed. Greed is what destroys our environment. Greed is what undoes democracy. Greed is the enemy of every good thing. Wow, 10 little commandments, not so little. I, I wish it was as simple as some people would have us believe that if they were just more widely available or, or posted on more walls somewhere, our moral and ethical situation would improve. But knowing is not enough. The best thing we can do is to live the commandments. Because in the end, the moral life cannot be commanded. The real law must be written on our hearts. And the real evidence for it must be made manifest in our lives. You know, 
I don't think God is out to get us for breach of contract. I think God is something else. I think God is the siren song of covenant. So let's sign on that dotted line. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer this morning, we thank you for loving us so much that you placed us in this wonderful and abundant world, overflowing with signs of your love and your grace. The beauty of this earth experienced on a crisp fall day like this, we give to you our thanks. For our family, our friends, our homes, the daily gifts of food and freedom, all the ways that you have blessed us, we give you thanks. Give to us, dear God, a, a sense of awareness and gratitude for your gifts, but give us also a sense of responsibility. Help us to, to overflow with love and generosity toward others, especially those in need. Let us give in some small portion from the rich abundance that we have been given. We pray this morning, Lord, for all those closest and most special to us. We pray that they feel your presence and your support in this most difficult time. We send our prayers, Lord, where we cannot go. To all those around the world who are victims of this pandemic and injustice and persecution. We pray this day, Lord, and always for the young women and the young men who serve this country. Protect them and help them to know that they are not alone. And finally, Lord, we ask your blessings upon this church. In these times of challenge, guide us by the power of your spirit at work in us. Lead this church into the days and the weeks ahead to meet the challenges of this world and to bring to all the good news of your love. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
want to take just a moment here at the conclusion of our worship to say thanks for all the words of encouragement and for your continued financial support. We urge you to use our, our online giving and your contribution to the church or, or even stop by and drop it off during office hours. Most importantly, we want you to stay safe. Your contributions are important. They not only help us continue our ministries under these new circumstances, but also enables us to continue our outreach to our community and our missions around the world. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we bring our, here our treasures and our gifts. Some comes from plenty, some from need, some from deepest sorrow in the soul. But you, O oh Lord, you know our pledge is peace, our promise is of goodwill. Accept our gifts and all the life they bring. serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you.